Hello, what a joy it is to bring, be with you today and to bring you the second message in our new sermon series, Little Gods. And today we're going to talk about the little God of body image. Y'all can groan now, right? But I want to begin by asking, uh, how many of you remember school picture days? Okay, you're, you're there. Well, you know how it is. Every fall, and now I notice sometimes in the spring, these photographers descend upon schools to make pictures of our children. And we're trying to capture in some kind of form those things that we'll be able to see from year to year, how they've grown and, and how they've changed. And I'll never forget when my children were young and school picture day was a big thing. You know, that I can recall we'd lay out their clothes the night before and we would make sure their hair was washed and freshly trimmed and as I would send them out the door I would say smile nice because I knew that this was going to be the picture that the grandparents got and that sat on our office desk and would go in that photo album that one day I would build for them they're now 35 and 30 and still waiting but that's another point okay but you you get the point it's their their precious memories well, I reared my children that way because that's how I had been reared. It was the same set of rules that we followed when it was picture day. My mother would often give my helplessly straight hair a Tony home perm. And for many of you, you have no idea what that is. It was a torture device used upon children to make their hair curly, who otherwise didn't have curly hair, because you know, all girls, little girls are supposed to have curly hair. But anyway, we would go through that ordeal and we would pick out the perfect dress and we would go to school and I don't remember a whole lot about those pictures except that there were, we would um, you know, show up and everyone would be dressed in your finest because you actually got to wear what was then your church clothes to picture day, not your normal school clothes. Now just to have evidence that I did have the Tony Perms, I actually brought my pictures for you from West Haven Elementary School. So here's first grade and second grade. Precious, right? And third grade. See the curly hair? Yeah, so there are snickering in the, in the congregation here for those of you watching at home. But you can see, it, it, was, it was really important to get those pictures made. And I don't recall a lot of the details, but I do recall this. One, we got out of class, which was always a thrill. And then we would go and we would line up on the steps to the stage in the gym. And there would always be a volunteer mom who would be there and she would have a comb and she would touch up your hair and she would make sure your collar was straight and make sure that you were all primped and, and ready to go. And then she would push you up on the stage and go smile with this warmth and feeling good. I remember that. And I don't remember specifically first, second, and third grade. I just remember that that was the norm. But I do remember fourth grade. See, in fourth grade for picture day, my mother wasn't there to help me get ready. My mother was lying in traction in a hospital bed as she dealt with excruciating pain from a condition known as scoliosis, what we might call curvature of the spine. And with every twist and turn of her spine, nerves would become pinched and press upon one another. And now that can be mediated through surgery, but in her day, it could not. And so as the pain would increase, they would put her in the hospital and they would put her into traction in an attempt to take the pressure off those nerves. And that's where she was on the day that I was to have my fourth grade picture made. Well, my dad was doing the best he could. He was working full time. He was making sure we were fed. He was making sure we had our homework done. He was making sure that we didn't kill one another because there were three of us at home. And let me tell you, picture day was not on his agenda. So I remember getting up that morning and pulling out the, the clean dress that I had and pushing my hair back in its typical headband and heading for school ready for picture day. 
And when we lined up on those steps and that volunteer mom came to me with her comb in her hand, I'll never forget, she looked at me and she sighed. She put the comb down and turned to the next child. There was no reassurance, no straightening of the collars, nothing that affirmed to me that I was worth looking at. And I bravely brought you that picture. Okay, you can take it down now. Okay. But you see, up until that time, I'm not given a lot of thought to body image. But the message given to me in that instant of being assessed and then dismissed and found unfavorable by an adult would sear into my mind and into my thoughts about myself. And it would resound in my head for years and years to come. And even this day, when I see that picture, I'm taken back to that place of being found unworthy and unacceptable because of an insensitivity by an adult. And I have a feeling that I'm not alone, that all of us have felt that at some point in our life, that, that sense where you're not good enough, you're not worthy enough, you're not pretty enough to be of value. And that comment would begin for me, my own search, to understand well, what is beautiful? What is acceptable in terms of a body image? And I would go through these phases of needing my hairstyle to be like everyone else's or changing my makeup to highlight one feature and downplay another. I would feel the need to wear certain clothes that I might fit in and, and to, to burn calories or eat calories depending upon where I was on any given day and to come to accept that being tall was not a negative thing because all girls should be petite. And just when I had enough confidence to feel good about myself again, it would seem that out of nowhere came that unexpected remark or jab that would send me spiraling downward again. In college, I was asked by a fellow student who had met my husband who was then my fiance, the day after she saw him, she actually looked at me and she said, how did someone like you get someone like him? And the body image. And it's just not a thing for women. I'll never, rec I always remember the jeers my older brother got who was always described as painfully thin. When he was in a basketball game in front of the whole school and they played shirts and skins and he had the misfortune of being a skin and every rib protruding from his thin body and listening to the cat calls and the remarks. And throughout my teaching days and into adulthood, I've never ceased to be amazed at all manner of disrespect and criticism we can flail at one another. Everything from your height, your weight, to the size of your nose, the size of your feet, the size of your breast, your muscles, your dimples, the color of your eyes, the color of your skin. Nothing seems out of bounds to critique. And I often told parents that if you can get your child through middle school with any self-esteem intact, consider it a victory. And through it all, I'm left to wonder, how do we come into the world as these beautiful babies full of wonder and delight, enjoying our life and the joys of being with each other where we feel easily accepted, to becoming a nation that in 2019 spent $17 billion on cosmetic plastic surgery, $42 billion on cosmetics, $33 billion on weight loss products, a billion dollars on just whitening our teeth, and $16 million in non-invasive cosmetic procedures. That's just in the U.S. Well, why do we do that? Well, 
Some rightfully do so because it gives one a sense of self-confidence. And please don't hear me say that we should not be concerned about our appearance because it's what makes us feel confident and strong perhaps when we go out. And some do it to correct an abnormality or physical condition that they may have been born with or dealing with. But what I'm talking about today when we come to making our body image a little God is really what I'm talking about when the thoughts of our body begin to consume us and we begin to look at other people and idealize what they have wishing that we had it then we begin to walk on this shaky ground of developing a little God of body image over the bigger God image within us and in this case, we've become obsessed by a culture that seeks to, to define our physical beauty with a set of characteristics few of us will ever meet. And if we do meet them, you can't maintain them. Ask any aging celebrity figure. We often define ourselves by how well our physical image stacks up against some other unrealistic expectation and depending upon the fad of the moment that expectation seems to con consistently change did you know that it was just a little over a hundred years ago that women who we would now consider obese or out of shape were actually the choice for artists to use in their paintings and artist productions women who were well endowed women who were what we might call now a little flabby, were actually referred to as elegant and voluptuous. I'm ready for those days to return. But likewise, if you had white skin, you were considered beautiful because if you had a tan or darker skin, it would uh, seem to indicate that you had to be out of doors and therefore you weren't refined or elegant. There was a time when the shape of one's nose and the structure of your chin told you who was elite and who was not. And men who had muscles were considered laborers and not intelligent. And then with the explosion of media, we've gotten down to all these different fads, which is why as a senior in high school, I had the Charlie Angel shag haircut that really was beautiful for its day. But see, whoever's trending is somehow the perfect example. And yet what I've seen over time is that the trendsetters don't, uh, aren't really very much at peace with their own trend. They never feel quite acceptable enough. And the problem like that is because how we think we look on the outside influences how we feel we are on the inside. And that is leading to this wide assortment of issues, everything from bullying to physical uh, mutilation of the body, everything from our mental and emotional health to addictions and ultimately suicide are caused by people who cannot accept their physical image, instead longing to have another. Well, I'm here to tell you that meeting some cultural definition of what it is that is acceptable is not at all God's desire for us or a view of us. The psalmist writes in one of my favorite psalms, 139, which I hope all of you've read and will read frequently. But the psalmist understands their value in light of God because this is what they say, I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made your works are wonderful and I know them full well in first Peter there's a, a scripture there that reminds us that we are God's precious chosen children and it reminds me of that song that we learn as children and somehow don't keep up with that Jesus loves the little children all the children of the world red brown yellow black and white they are precious in his sight Jesus loves the little children of the world. You see, up until third grade, that little girl in that picture felt precious. She felt accepted by the world and, and she loved the innocence of that. And yet an insensitive remark, an insensitive look 
would pull her into a culture that said, how you look is much more important than who you are and what you do. It is a message too many of us have bought into. And in so doing, what we're doing in the process of that is overshadowing what is it that's God's view of us. See, when we buy into cultures, culture's erroneous view of our body image, it negates the significance that we've all, all been created into the very image of God. Right in the first of our Bible, the first of our story about our creation story, God says, let us make humankind in our image, meaning we've been made in the same image of God, the Father, God, the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit. And it's funny, I have been in groups where I've asked people to, uh, tell me what God looks like. Describe God for me in terms of physicality. And do you know what? No one has an answer. Well, I can't really see a physical part. And then when I say, well, what about Jesus? Describe for me Jesus. And they begin to put some characteristics. And what we're drawing to be able to do that is the time in which Jesus lived and the place in which he lived had the defining characteristics of people who lived in that area. But it's all guess. And did you know in the Gospels, not one mention is made of Jesus' physicality. Not one mention. The prophet Isaiah, when he was prophesying about the coming Messiah, said this. He had no beauty or majesty to attract him to us. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. See, we all make those characteristics about him. But in reality, we, just like those who can't imagine a physicality of God, imagine the, the inner characteristics of God that we're drawn to. And the same thing was true for Jesus. What he looked like was not what attracted people to him. It's who he was that attracted people to him. That was the important image. Secondly, when we buy into a culture that erroneous view of worth is based upon body image, it can cause our outer image to take precedent over our inner image, the spirit of God within us. You may recall the story of the one who had become King David. His story begins in the book of 1 Samuel, and Samuel is asked by the Lord to anoint a new king. King Saul's not working out, and we need another king to be anointed that's going to come along and take his place. And so Saul asked Jesse, bring me your sons. And you remember David didn't make the cut. He was the youngest and the scrawniest of the lot. And we learn that they will keep asking until David is brought forward. And we'll hear Jesse kind of giving reasons why he should not be included to be anointed. And the Lord clearly tells Samuel this. He said, um, let me find my scripture. He said, the Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at outward appearances but the Lord looks at the heart. Jesus would say something of a similar thing this time to the Pharisees in the Gospel of Matthew. And he would say, Woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but inside are full of bones of the dead and everything unclean. Jesus was looking inwardly. And he recognized that this human body that we all have is simply a vessel. These vessels come in all sorts of sizes and shapes and colors. And what makes a shape in the vessel important is not how it looks outwardly, but that it houses the spirit of the living God inside it. Paul would be talking to the people of Corinth, a decadent city where outward beauty and sexuality were the norm of the day. And he would sum it up this way. He says, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, who you receive from God? You're not your own. You are bought with a price. 
Therefore, honor God with your bodies. And when I read that, it causes us to have these moments of self-reflection that ask us the question, are we seeking to honor and therefore please God with our bodies which house his spirit and keeping it healthy and undefiled? Are we attempting to create a body that's more pleasing to culture than it is pleasing to God? Another problem when we expect the culture's view to be our view it can cause us to love and accept what we see in others by their outward appearance rather than looking inwardly deeper and recognizing the God image therein have you ever noticed that in the gospel there was not one person's appearance who Jesus was off put by he called the short statured Zacchaeus he called the poor hemorrhaging woman he spoke to the woman who had been uh, outcast at the, at the well and so many others and you see in that time if you were lame or blind or physically deformed or had disease or anything else you literally lived outside the town and if you came into town people would pass you by totally unnoticed so much so that they would scream out to ask for help and Jesus said, do not be that way. He recognized everybody. He saw everybody. And there was nothing off-putting about anything physical about him that he didn't find the image of God that they bore. And when we, too, do the same thing, we're going to miss the talents and gifts and abilities and, and wonderful blessings that each of us possess, no matter what the outward part of us looks like. And it keeps us from living unified in the community that God wants us to live in and to see each person of value and worth. And lastly, when we bind to culture's erroneous idea of what's worth, we are kept from loving ourselves. You know, part of the great commandment that Jesus gave us was to love others as yourself. Now, we sometimes think, well, self-love is narcissistic. Well, narcissistic love is bad. Well, we just think of loving ourselves to the expense of everyone else. But Jesus expects us to have a, a level of love for ourselves because then we can see that we are the creation of our, an artistic and powerful God one who said in the psalm knit us together in our mother's womb and takes delight and pleasure in our being one who thought we were important enough and worthy enough to die for isn't that a humbling and breathtaking idea that you are beautiful enough to even die for and I have to wonder how many times we have hurt God by criticizing the artistic production that he made in creating each of us. As I've shared with many of you, I have dealt with body image issues, with issues of worth and beauty that said, am I good enough, smart enough, worthy enough, attractive enough? And life and experiences have been great teachers. One of my life's greatest teachings regarding this issue occurred in my own home. As I noted, my mother would have a spinal curvature that continued to wreak havoc on her body and shorten her life ultimately. Yet when I looked at my mother, I never saw that. I saw her wit, I saw her compassion, I saw her understanding and I saw magnificent grace that when people made unkind and sensitive comments about her body, she gave them a break. And I was granted the gift of watching a love of my dad for her whose eyes would light up when she walked into a room, a love that was not limited to her earthly life but even after she passed, continued. And I've practiced the spiritual disciplines of prayer and engagement in God's word, and I've learned and become assured of the belief that I am wonderfully made and worthy. See, we get to that place only when you can release and surrender to that created story, and that it's God that I want to please. God that I was, whose opinion of me matters. God's whose image that I want to possess. 
And again, I go back to the words of Paul. In Galatians, he asked the people this question to ask themselves, am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I wouldn't be a servant of God. Well, I'm asking you today, folks, what are you willing to look at? Your outward image or the inner image? Who are you desiring to please, outwardly or inwardly? Because when we can focus inwardly, we can look beyond ourselves and we can recognize the true face and the image of God in one another. And when we see that, we see that what the world thinks, what culture says is beautiful, pales in comparison to what God says is beautiful. The title for our sermon was, Who Decides What's Beautiful? God has already decided. You are.